David Spada is a successful attorney whose dream was to become a sports talk show host. Elliot Harris is a Chicago sports columnist who wanted to expand his media presence. In the next hour, they combine their talents and love of sports and women by interviewing former professional athletes and lovely ladies on sports and torts. But keeping the boys out of trouble isn't always easy because when David and Elliot are together, they have more fun than should be legal. Elliot, my dream came true. This gentleman I've been working oh, on getting. It involves a gentleman, though. <laughs> I'm married. It's got to involve a gentleman. Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. that whoa, doesn't whoa, sound good second. either. Wait a second. <laughs> but I've been working on getting Jim Brown, you know, for when we had the old show, Sports and Torts, two years ago. And every time I thought we would get him, it just would fall off. But Very elusive. Sometimes dreams do come true. Yeah. Best running back in the history of uh, professional football. Sorry, Walter Payton fans. Or Gail. Or anybody else out there. <laughs> Emmett Smith, Barry Sanders, people like that. I think anybody that had a chance to see Jim Brown in his prime would say head and shoulders ab- above everybody else. You know, O.J. Simpson was phenomenal. Gail Sayers, tremendous. Walter Payton, you know. A remarkable career, but third down and three yards to go, and, I, and I'm going to hand the ball off to somebody. I'm, I'll hand it off to Jim Brown, and I know he'll get me at least three and a half. And we got almost 30 minutes of him talking to us earlier this week, so let's go right to the interview. On the phone, we've got the greatest player in NFL history. I'm going to come out and say it because I know it's true. I've talked to former contemporaries of his, and they said there was no guy tougher. The guy would run over you. He was unstoppable. He actually retired at the peak of his game. NFL Hall of Famer Jim Brown. How you doing, Mr. Brown? I'm doing fine, guys. How are you guys today? Good. So you went to Syracuse in college. From what I remember, you played not only football, but you were in what, lacrosse or rugby too? Uh, yes, I played lacrosse. I uh, loved the game. Great game. And uh, we had a very successful team there. Who were your teammates with Syracuse back then? Uh, well, uh, Roy Simmons was... Uh, Probably the most uh, known uh, player, teammate. He's an All American. He later became coach, won about three uh, championships. His father was a great coach. And then, and, uh, of course, uh, Jim Ridlon, who played football with me, he was also a great lacrosse player. So those two guys were guys that most of the general public would know about. They're both great guys and also great players. What made you choose Syracuse? Well, I had a uh, mentor, Kenny Malloy, Judge Malloy, from Manhasset. He was an alumnus of Syracuse. He took an interest in all the kids at Manhasset. He helped a lot of us tremendously. And he wanted me to go to his alma mater and uh, made arrangements for the people in the city to pay pay my way and, and send me there on trial. And uh, it was a fiasco in the beginning, but finally it worked out. And uh, it wasn't because of him that it was a fiasco, but uh, I don't think Syracuse wanted me at the time. But since he wanted me to go there, they followed through. And I really had to prove myself over about five times. And finally, uh, we came to grips with each other, and uh, now I'm a real good alumni of Syracuse. Why did Syracuse watch you at the time? Well, I mean, you wouldn't really have to ask them. I just wasn't one of their choices. At least some of the coaches there, uh, probably the head coach didn't. Uh, was that Schwartzwalder, Ben Schwartzwalder? Yeah, Ben, he, ben was a different kind of guy. They had a, another African-American there by the name of Aveda Stone, who was a quarterback, left them and went to Canada and played pro ball. And I think there was a lot of resentment, and they felt we had something in common being of the same color. I didn't know the guy. (laughs) And uh, they had problems with, I guess, having African-American players there that are independent individuals. And I was the, uh, ended up being the only African-American player on the team. 
But you also well, play a basketball. Lot of those things that I don't really like to talk about because it's, you know the school is a good school now. They have mm-hmm. made amends for all those things, and uh, the football team is on the rise right now. And you play what basketball at Syracuse also? Yeah, I played basketball, ran track. You weren't too shabby at basketball. I see you average eleven points a game as a junior. Well, <laughs> I uh, I love all sports, and uh, I tried to play as many as I could. But mainly uh, at Syracuse, football and lacrosse were my two two real sports. You know, lacrosse was a, a game of love because the coach was a great coach, and his son and I were, were really good friends. We're friends today, you know, and uh, we went undefeated in our senior year, which is really kind of good. And it's uh, it's a great game that has a Native American background. It was in created by the Native Americans and uh, used to be Canada's national sport. And a lot of people never knew that. Now it's, I think, the fastest growing sport in this country. I was going to say, it's taken a while. Is there a reason lacrosse, you know, it used to be the eastern seaboard for the most part and a little bit in the southeast, and now there's some in the Midwest. But professional lacrosse has had difficulty catching on. Well, actually, I have a small ownership in uh, the Long Island Lizards. Uh, just It just occurred, and uh, I'll be going back next week to another one of their games. I was there two weeks ago in New York, Hofstra College, and uh, it was a great experience, you know, to be with those youngsters and to see them play, and they won, thank goodness, scored 20 goals. And I had a great time relating to them on the differences in the game, but then I found out there wasn't that many differences. Could you the still stick is the same length? Of, you know, it's uh, forty-two inches is as short as you can have it. The pockets, uh, you know, the, the requirements are the same. And uh, as I tell a lot of people, there's not too many different things that you can do in sports. And so, as I watched the game, it brought back a lot of memories because uh, it's really the same game. Are you suit up for any game games? Uh, yeah, well, are you going to suit up with me? <laughs> if I had the chance to play lacrosse with you, I would. Uh, well, that's, we'll get rid of that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there was more money in professional football than professional lacrosse when you went into the NFL. Well, uh, there was no money in. Well, I don't think there was any professional lacrosse at the time. Uh, <clears throat> but I had had a better shot at that. You know, being a professional football player than any other sport. And I took advantage of it. You know, I had nine years as a member of the Cleveland Browns and very successful years and very happy years. And I never really played for money. I never did anything too much for money only. And, uh, you know, that's why I said I'm an all-around athlete because I love pretty much all sports. And I was also the decathlete events in track and field and uh you know when i was a senior in high school i finished fifth in the nation which i was very proud of because i had no coaching and i just really going out and my sponsor at the time wanted me to do it but like i said i love all sports pretty much what was paul brown your coach at cleveland like well paul was a very creative individual he was a visionary. He was a great pioneer for professional football. Uh, he created certain things like the uh, playbook, uh, you know, the face mask. He uh, was an individual that was sometimes misunderstood, but... Uh, I like playing under him because he was a very strict disciplinarian. And, uh, you know, everybody was afraid of him, so the team really stuck together and concentrated on playing football, which is what I really liked. See, now and, I, thought his, uh, I thought his playbook was hand the ball off to Jim Brown, left tackle, right tackle, up the middle, and, and that pretty much did it. Every once in a while, let Frank Ryan throw a pass. Well, I'll tell you, you know, Paul coach Otto Graham 
one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. And I'm sure he wasn't just handing it off to Marion Motley. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Frank Ryan did have the responsibility of always having to rescue us on third down because I'd get the first two shots at carrying the ball. <laughs> you know, so I give him a lot of credit as a quarterback to uh, take that responsibility. But Paul relied on me a lot, and I loved it, you know, playing for the Browns because of that. You know, I wanted the ball. And I got it enough to be, you know, a very successful running back. When we talked to former baseball players and they asked them who the greatest player of all time was, most say May, some say Mano, but when we asked former football players, every single one of them says Jim Brown. How does that make you feel? Well, uh, let me be very honest with you. I don't live my life based upon uh, trophies, uh you know, awards, opinions. I respect a lot of, of opinions. I have my own. And, uh, you know, when the, and when your teammates or your opposing players feel that you are a great, you know, competitor, that's a good compliment. That's a, a solid compliment because they usually won't tell anything that they don't say anything that they don't believe. So I can take that, accept that compliment to a certain degree, but uh, I usually know what I what I can do, what I can't do, and, and I usually know how I performed. And that's, you know, I'm a greatest critic, and I don't think anyone has ever heard me say that I'm the best at anything because I think it's uh, something that we shouldn't try to judge ourselves as because there are too many variables in a team sport. You know, if it was boxing or something, it would be different. But in a team sport, you depend upon each other. And like LeBron James has proven himself to be a great team player. And I love him for it because people overlook the greatness of a team player. You know, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, uh, you know, Bill Russell, these type of individuals. Uh, are the ones that I like because they understand team sports and how important the last guy on your team is because he might be the uh, difference in winning and losing. Now, was the 64 Browns team that won the championship, was that the best team you were ever on? Uh, Football team? Yes, sir. Yes, it was. (laughs) We had a good team. And uh, as I was saying earlier, Everybody participated in that 64 game and beat the Baltimore Colts. And uh, they were like a Hall of Fame team. You know, they had many Hall of Famers on the, on the team. And then the great Johnny Unitas was the quarterback. And, you know, Raymond Berry was there. John Mackey was there. Big Daddy Lipscomb was there. Uh, it was an unbelievable team. And we beat them, I think, 27 nothing. I think they were favored by three touchdowns. And uh, we had individuals that did their job tremendously. And uh, we were able to shut them out. You know, and once again, you know, the offense got all the credit. But the defense didn't allow them to score a point. It just goes to show you that sometimes, you know, the media or public opinion isn't always what we see as players. And we have a great appreciation for contribution of others that, you know, a lot of times the general public won't even see. I talked to Sam Huff last year, and he said one of his favorite moments in sports was being able to stop you. And he's got a picture of that in his office, him tackling you. Do you remember that tackle? Well, no, I don't remember that tackle. I would be a a big liar because I'm not looking at the picture, first of all. He he remembers that (laughs) toll vividly. He must not have made very many on you. No, Sam made a lot of tackles. Sam was a great uh, middle linebacker for the Giants, very smart, good friend of mine, you know, good advocate for professional football, and uh, played on some really great Giant teams. He was a leader on those teams, and uh, I always had great respect for him and great respect for his abilities. Did you ever wish you were playing defense? Uh, I don't do a lot of wishing. 
<laughs> did you did you ever think about it? <laughs> well, I did play defense in college. You know, I was a defensive halfback in college, uh, and all throughout my athletic career, I played defense. But as a pro, you know, uh, we didn't. We played one way, and that was good enough for me because you know, uh, in professional football, you have to really concentrate. And it would have been very difficult to play both positions. How fast were you during your prime? Uh, I was uh, fast. And my speed combined with quickness and balance and strength and power. So I had a combination of things that all worked together. You know, you might be the fastest guy in the world, but if you don't use it properly, it doesn't you know, really uh, materialize into anything. But, like, you know, I was fast enough. You know, I ran a, a, a 40. I never got beat in a 40. Nope. But uh, it's interesting you ask about speed because I always worked on my starts as a high school football player because my coach wanted me to. And it gave me an advantage because I could get out of the blocks real quick. And that always helps in, in professional football if you can really accelerate quickly. Uh, it's a great asset to have. And your size didn't hurt you either. I, I can remember you at about 230, 235, and here comes Larry Wilson from the St. Louis Cardinals trying to tackle you, and he, he might have been 170, maybe 175 with all his football gear on. And it didn't look like much of a contest between the two, although every once in a while he, he would bring you down. Well, I'll tell you something that's very interesting. You know, Larry Wilson's number was number eight. <laughs> now, I, why, how would I remember guy's number? Well, when I first came in contact with him, uh, this guy tackled me, and I didn't know where he came from. I looked down, it was number eight on his jersey. So I went back and I told uh, my teammates, boy, that number eight put a hell of a tackle on me, you know, because that guy's too small to stop me, but he did. <laughs> Caught me around my ankles. And I said, uh, you know, we're going to have to watch out for him. Then a few plays later, he did the same thing. I said, we're really going to have to watch out for him because he can really play. So when he went into the Hall of Fame, I think uh, it was one of my favorites because he was a smaller guy, but very good at tackling big guys like myself getting low, you know, wrapping our ankles up. When your ankles are wrapped up, you can't employ too much power. They don't, a lot of respect for Larry. Yeah, if, 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 if he had gone any higher than about your ankles, I think you just would have bowled him over. I mean... Well, what I would have done, you know, is, <laughs> is up the speculation, <laughs> but I'm saying that you know, you brought him up, you brought him up for a reason. You didn't bring him up because he couldn't play. No. I'll tell you um, one but, thing, though. They don't teach proper technique in the NFL anymore, and I think if they did that, there would be less concussions. Well, I think if they would concentrate on getting rid of dirty players, then uh, there'd be less everything negative. And I always say that we, you know, everybody's talking about the helmet and helmet to helmet and this and that. But every owner should be responsible for his own team. And you weed out those people that try to hurt other people. And your game will be okay. How do you walk away from the game when you're at your height? I mean, you did it and very few other athletes do it. What made you decide enough was enough? Well, because I have a very well-rounded life. You know, I'm a college graduate. I'm an activist. I've been an activist all my life. Uh, I have an organization now uh, called American. We work in schools across the country. We work with violence across the country. Uh, I've started uh, musical groups to Friends of Distinction with my group, Earth, Wind, Fire. I got them their first record contract. Uh, I've done many, many things in my life. I've been an entrepreneur in many ways. And uh, I try to be as much of a humanitarian as I can be. So uh, leaving football 
you know, and and uh, 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 was not hard for me at all because, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was a well-rounded person, and uh, I took an interest in, in doing things other than just being a an athlete. So to me, it is the wise thing to do. I knew that my legacy would be based upon the fact that I had left at age 29. We won the championship in 1964. I was MVP of the league in 1965 when I retired. And, uh, you know, when I say that, I don't have to say anything else. Okay. You know, there's nothing for anyone else to say. You know, so it's a, a legacy that stands very tall because I did leave at the height of my career. And most everybody stays a little bit too long or wants to make that comeback, that, that one more season. Well, see, now you're talking. Now you sound like me. <laughs> People stay too long. You know, there's no reason to stay that long. It's only a part of your life. You should not put too much importance on it. Uh, your education is going to ultimately prove to be the best thing you can acquire. And uh, if you do not understand economic development, then you're going to have a problem. I think with all the money that the players make today, after three years, most of them declare bankruptcy, no, which is a, a shame. No one teaches them how to manage their money. Very few, like you said, players are successful after they retire because, again, they can't manage their money. But one who I know has been extremely successful in contemporary years, Gail Sayers, I mean, he's a multi-multi-millionaire because he knew how to handle his money. Well, Gil is a, a dear friend of mine and a wonderful human being. and He's a very smart young man. I love him. And I'm glad you brought him up because uh, I have nothing but respect for him. And you're absolutely right. You know, you have to manage your money, regard, especially if you make a lot, because the more you make, the more trouble you can get into. And the one thing that will always be a major problem is taxes because in your financial planning, you have to take taxes into consideration very strongly. And if it's not in your plan properly, it can backfire on you later. And once you're in trouble with the IRS, you're really in trouble. So regardless of how much money you make, you have to really manage it properly and consider your taxes and, any kind of deferred payments have to be allowable, and uh, you have to be very careful with your investments and so forth and so on. So, you know, you're absolutely right. Very few players manage their money uh, correctly. And then my, very few agents can really tell players the truth because players will buy an agent if he's not just talking about making more money. And in order to really be successful, you've got to live off an allowance. I mean, it has to be, you know, each year you have to decide what it is that you can live off of, pay the proper taxes, and uh, uh, have the balance that you need. So when people make a lot of money, or players make a lot of money, they think they can just spend a lot of it. But if you throw the plan out of whack, then you, you have a problem with the uh, Internal Revenue Services. And uh, that's like the kiss of death. What said to you that after football I should go into acting? An opportunity that knocked on my door. I was uh, offered a part in a movie because I was a football player and had some notoriety. And uh, after uh, I did that part, I decided to get an agent, Phil Gersh, a great agent, and he got me a part in A Dirty Dozen, which was a tremendous hit. And uh, I got good reviews. So high-profile profession, it plays a lot of money. Uh, why not? <laughs> I tried it and had an opportunity to uh, break down a few doors, break down some taboos. And I had a lovely uh, acting career. You got to star in a movie with uh, Raquel Welch and Burt Reynolds, 100 Rifles. What was that like? Well, it was a quite an experience because it was the first time that an African-American male had a major love scene with a 
Caucasian female. There's a lot made of that. Raquel and I didn't make very, a lot of, you know, of it, but at the time it was like breaking down doors. And uh, I enjoyed it, you know, because I felt not only was I making more money and I had a chance to do something different, I could probably uh, open up opportunities for, for people that deserve opportunities. And so I looked at it that way. And did some some you know some meaningful film. Who, who was your favorite actor to work with or actress? Uh, my favorite actor, I think, was Al Pacino. Uh, Al Pacino was a great actor, uh, uh, Hall of Fame actor, and a great guy. And I had uh, a couple of real scenes with him, and had the pleasure of being a recipient of his abilities and some meaningful scenes. And uh, with him being a nice guy on top of it, it was just a great experience. Who was a better what? actor, David Hasselhoff or the car in Knight Rider when you were in that show? Say that again? Who was a better actor when you were in the episode of Knight Rider, David Hasselhoff or the car, Kit? <laughs> <laughs> well, your sense of humor is well taken. <laughs> Uh, okay. I might beg to uh, to answer that question. You know, I don't know. Okay, let me ask you: <laughs> Who was the better actor, Jim Brown or Fred the Hammer Williamson? Well, you know, I don't get into who's better than, than, than who's better than somebody else. I think that's a very limited kind of conversation. You know, I appreciated uh, Fred's intelligence because Fred was a producer and a director, and he did a lot of small films, which I acted in with him, you know, as a partner of his. So I uh, had great admiration for his ability to understand the business and cut a niche out in the business for himself. As far as competition, uh, I only compete with myself. You know, I never got into uh, competing with other people uh, this whole best thing, I think it's it's uh, it's a weakness to go around talking about you're the best at something. Your performance speaks for itself. Your actions speak for themselves. And if you're comfortable with yourself, you don't have to really get into uh, who is the best. Are you back in the Browns? organization or you still have some issues with them? That's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, John Wooten, my teammate, uh, contacted me and Leroy Kelly is going to be inducted in their ring of uh, fame and John really wanted me to come back and be a part of our family, which is the players felt me, you know, we're, we're Browns regardless. And I said, John, you know, for Ernie, who did all the blocking for me, just like we did for Gene Hickerson when he got inducted to all the fame, Leroy Kelly, Bobby Mitchell, and myself went back to show our respect and love for him. So I'm going to go back and show my respect for Ernie Green and show him and his family and the fans that I have great appreciation for the blocking that he did and he didn't get a lot of credit for it, so we can call attention to uh, this man being recognized. It's worth it to go back and do that for me, so I'm going to do that. And, uh, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with being on the ins or on the outs because I'm a Cleveland Brown, and he is a teammate. And ultimately, it is your teammates that come first. So... That will be at least a breakthrough to some degree. That was legendary Cleveland Brown, Jim Brown. One of a kind. Re in a remarkable individual. Interesting life. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to get to an interview you did with. S speaking legendary life, softball great Jenny Finch. Stay tuned. <laughs> 